What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? All right, here we go, Francis Fry. It's so good to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Oh, thanks so much, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I love your background, and there's a lot of stories for us to get to. Um, but I'm first very interested in, and I know you already know this from us from our pre-chat, but I'm interested in people, specifically leaders, who have found a way to sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Not the one hit wonders, but the ones who have been doing it in some cases for decades. And you certainly qualify as one of those, but you've also done a great job of surrounding yourself with others that have done the same. What, Francis, have you found to be some of the commonalities among leaders who have sustained excellence? That's great. So uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, uh, over time, they lead as if physics applies. Hmm. Tell so me what more. I'm gonna yeah. so I'll so I'll tell you more. So um, you know there might be short periods of time where cost has to be greater than revenue, or short period of time where we can be better than the competition at a lot of things. But ultimately, it's going to get to steady state, and so in order for us to have sustained excellence, like if we're gonna beat the competition at some things, what are, what are they gonna beat us at? So this notion that we can beat the competition at everything, that will not coincide with sustained excellence for the following reason. You know, when Uber went into the taxi to compete against taxis, yes, they could be better than taxis at everything because it was like a novel way of doing it. But then when Lyft starts competing with Uber, neither Lyft nor Uber is going to be better than one another at everything. And so as soon as they realize that and try to differentiate, the sooner that they'll be better. So I think physics applies in terms of economics, revenue greater than cost, in terms of competitors. If you have good competitors, the goal isn't to try to be more like them. It's actually to try to be more differentiated uh, than them. So in general, and then people, I would say leaders that um, you know, people that are competing on their energy, that's going to last for five minutes. And then you have to compete on your ability to create greatness and, and bring out greatness in other people. And so there's, there's a lot there. I, I, I've, I think this is actually a video where I watched you talk about the number one obstacle to excellence. And you've said it's, it's desiring to be great at everything. And so there's actually a time when you should disappoint your customers. Um, and, and I think your, your phrase, phraseology of this is in order to be great, you have to be bad, but we need the wisdom to know what to be great at. And that's the real critical point here. So can you expand on that aspect sure. of excellence and understanding, you know, where can we disappoint our customers? Yeah, so, and the example that really uh, hit home to me was listening to Steve Jobs talk about the MacBook Air when the MacBook Air first came out. Mm -hmm. And he was like, or it was right before it was going to come out. He's like, look, we're, we have the best designers in the world. It was hard to argue. We have put them to work and they have made it the lightest weight laptop on the market, which is exactly what they wanted to do. It's like unbelievable. He said, but in order to be best in class at weight, we're worst in class at extra functionality, like an internal CD-ROM drive and a really heavy battery and things like that. They, he said, we could have been best in class at physical features, but then we would have been worst in class at weight. And he said, the third thing is we could have chosen to be average at both. I find way too many companies choose to be average at both. By trying to be best in class at weight and trying to be best in class at physical features, you end up average at both. So the message that Steve Jobs gave, which is the one I agree with completely, is that if you're going to be great, what are you going to be disproportionately good at? And then reverse engineer, what do you have to be bad at in order to support that? Mm -hmm. So that you're making a trade-off that your competitors are unwilling to make. Then it becomes super, super interesting. But if you're just going to like compete as hard as you can against a competitor and they're going to compete as hard as they can against you. I've seen this time and time again. Customers can stop telling the difference between you. 
employees loathe working at both of you because you just have them sacrificing more and more of their lives on the altar of the organizations. Also that the customer gets an identical experience because then you know what happens to willingness to pay when you get an identical experience, it just plummets. Mm -hmm. So that's my long winded double click on it. And, and one of the, 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 the more challenging parts, or I guess could be more challenging aspects of this is for service organizations. And you've delineated yeah. the difference between because yes. a MacBook Air it, we can feel it and see it oh, yes. it's so light and nice that you're willing to give up some of the plug-in capabilities or shorter battery, whatever it may yeah. be. But in a service organization, which there are a lot of people who work in those, how, how, how do you go about that equation of, well, we have to give excellent service at everything that we do, right? How, how, for, for the person that, that does that, and I'm, I'm one of them, by the way, how, how do you, do I, make the decision on what to be great at as well as what to not be good at. Yeah. And that's why I think the phrase um, act as if physics, apply, physics applies matters, because if you're making the MacBook Air, you can drop it on your foot, physics applies. For services, you can't drop it on your foot. You can't see the physics applies, but indeed you have to act as if they do. So mm -hmm. for you that you're trying to, you can try to serve, you know, everyone equally, but as soon as your customers have um, opposing needs. Uh, I want you to be available at midnight. They want you to be available at 7 a.m. Which one of us are you going to be um, more energized to serve? Hmm. We are seemingly incompatible. You could try to get both of us to compromise, but that doesn't sound great because you'll get picked off on either side. So at some point, the person who wants to be served at midnight, you're going to have to figure out how to serve them at midnight and i doubt it's going to be the same you that's going to be serving someone else at 7 a.m mm -hmm. interesting um okay there's so much here uh, i i mentioned to you but i didn't give you the full details francis that yeah. part of my preparation process is if i am fortunate enough to know somebody who knows my guest really well that i will write them an email saying Tell me something about Frances that I cannot find in her books or on the internet. And that's hard because there's a lot out there about you because you, you're a very distinguished leader. You've done a lot. And I, the first person, I, so I have two, two of those people I spoke wow. to. This one. So the first one I want to share, and I know you know her well, is Kara short sleeve oh. who runs she and I got to know her actually a year ago um and you you can you can describe uh, how you and Kara work together but one of the things she says and this may make you smile because it's a little bit uh off the script of normal but I thought it would be good to to, to do this at near the beginning is she loves meaning Francis Kara said she loves Scooby snacks. <laughs> and this is on the topic. Now, I think we can relate this to the business too. Yeah. This is on the topic of giving and receiving feedback and positive reinforcement. And she said that you like to focus on what went well as a way to reinforce positive behaviors. So first, maybe you could talk, say a little bit about Kara and why she's so good. Yeah. So Kara is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's yeah. amazing. She's yeah. totally amazing. She's the CEO of the leadership uh, consortium, which is, which had the observation that I, they can help one company at a time, but if they can get companies to work together, they can accelerate the leadership progress of the people in there. And it's worked magnificently well. Mm -hmm. So she's incredible. Mm -hmm. The, one of the things that we have learned is that there's two types of feedback I can give you. One is evaluative. So, you know, end of year. The other is feedback along the way in hopes of making you better. Hmm. That's improvement oriented. If I want to give you improvement oriented feedback, there's no question that I have to give you much more positive reinforcement than constructive advice to be successful. Really? So that's the first thing that's totally surprising to people because most people are like, trained to grin and bear it from the constructive feedback like here's how you should behave differently that's actually not nearly as helpful for an improvement orientation as i just did these hundred things things went well but i don't know which 10 of the hundred were <laughs> so if you give me sincere and specific advice on it's when you did this and it did that and that that's what propelled it forward so if you give me sincere and specific and actionable positive reinforcement I will get better at a much faster rate than any other kind of feedback you can give me. 
Now, let's say that you really want to give me constructive advice because you're seeing something I'm doing. You're welcome to, but you have to have at least a five to one ratio. You have really? to have a found. Yeah. Wow. Otherwise, the constructive advice is going to put me in a destruct in a defensive crouch. It might destabilize me. And you always know it's working. If you give me feedback, if I get better, your feedback was effective. If I get worse, your feedback was ineffective. What most of the world does is they'll lob constructive advice somewhere, give themselves credit for having said it, but take no responsibility for whether or not it was it actually resulted in the person getting better. If you actually want the person to get better, you need at least a five to one ratio. I call the sincere and, and positive feedback Scooby Snacks because it's, um, and we're distributing Scooby Snacks all the time, or I'd like us to be, because I can make people better around me now super quickly because I've gotten very good at the sincere and the specific um, part of doing it. Like it's amazing on your podcast that you went out and found Kara and this one other person uh, is a way to enrich. So I didn't just say good job. I told you sincerely and specifically what part of it was there. I give you a Scooby snack for that. You're more likely to do that repeatedly. That's most likely to make you better. So um, I'm glad that we're bringing this up because part of the coaching element of leading a team is I was once taught that um, you should use the phrase, uh, use, I, they, they deem this PCP, which is praise, criticism, and praise. It was actually a sandwich metaphor. Yeah, right? it's terrible advice. I'm really okay. sorry it ever good. got out in the public. Okay, good. Because I, yeah. I actually wrote about this in, in, in my book about why this was so bad because oh, part, of, good. part of the trust element here, and, and we're going to get to uh, the trust triangle, which you've, you've, you've come up with, is that is not authentic. And yeah. um, uh, at, least, at least the way I've seen it used is not authentic. Um, because you're, if, if you're forced to conjure up some sort of praise, either on the front end or the back end, and really all you're thinking about is the C, the criticism. And so you make something up here and then you give them the harsh criticism and then you make something up here, it doesn't work. And then when you actually want to give them real praise, it really doesn't work because yeah. they're saying, well, I don't know, they've been lying to me or they've been making stuff up because I know they wanted to criticize me. How, can, you, can you expand more on why this PCP model that has been taught to managers, it was taught to me, is not useful? Well, I, you know, I, maybe it was the best someone could come up with in the past before, yeah. they, before we learned that the goal of feedback is for someone else to improve. Mm -hmm. So, whoever came up with that idea certainly wasn't testing the improvement trajectory of people who they were saying it to because it would have shown that it didn't work immediately. So they were probably just coming up with things that sound good and resonate. And I say it to you and you're like, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. And then I'll let's, well, let's write it down. And we, it's easy to remember PCP. Um, but there was no performance. Um, there was no feedback on the performance of it. But as soon as people started saying, okay, feedback is about making other people better. It's not about anything else. My job is to make you better as a result of the feedback I give you. That sandwich is going to go out the door very quickly. Mm -hmm. But the science does state, though, that you need a five to one ratio, which is a little bit surprising to me, especially when I think back to some of my football coaches. Um, that definitely didn't apply. And I thought some of them were very effective. And maybe that's, maybe that's specific to that sport or to my age at the time. I'm curious. I definitely didn't feel that five to one ratio. Well, yet. football did it in a lot of, um, you know, all of those stickers on your helmet. Like huh. football had a lot of insidious positive reinforcement, every whack you got. Uh, so I would go back for great coaches. I would go back and take a look at what the – what the ratios? Why is it five were. to one? Why? Why do? You, why is that the number? Well, and and some of the research shows it's ten to one. So wow. I I like to coach people at the minimum so as not to scare them, um, and I think it's because, look, for you to for me to believe you see me, for me to believe that you're like you get me, like you got to see what I'm doing and what I'm doing well. If you're only seeing what I'm doing badly, you might just be seeing a caricature of me. You, I don't like, and why I should then trust you enough to change my trajectory? It's um, it'd be weird. Instead, I'm probably just going to get defensive. Um, yep. 
but just go ahead and, and HBR has had a bunch of articles recently, but you can look back at the Morton Hansen, I, I think called it the feedback fallacy. Um, but I haven't seen any work in the last several years that shows that constructive advice is a good way, like alone is a good way to go. Yeah. Uh, I think that time has long passed. So Francis, what about for the, the, the mid-level manager right now who's listening, who has a team of 14 people that are direct reports, and there are two people on that team who are not performing, they show up late, they, they, let's just, they, have a, uh, they run the gamut of poor behavior, and they're not doing very much well. Uh, how, and and you're gonna, you want to provide them feedback with the goal of helping them get better. Well, yeah. make sure that's what you want to do. Okay. You, I mean, one could argue you should, one could argue they're not thriving. And if you tried it a couple of times, maybe they should be thriving somewhere else. Gotcha. Okay. So I was thinking, so, so what is your view, viewpoint from a, a manager, manager's perspective on, I guess this could be a whole podcast worth of a conversation here, but, but when it comes to making these tough choices about feedback to improve as well as let's say they should go, they should go get. Well, that's a separate else. thing. So, right. Yep. So once you've decided that you're committed to someone improving, I can help you with feedback. It's a gotcha. very separate question of whether or not I should separate from someone. Gotcha. And, um, and I'm happy to have both of them, but for the feedback conversation, um, what I shouldn't do is I'm not sure if I'm invested in you. So I'm going to try this, but not really, that's not going to work. But if I'm invested in you and I'm done when you're better. This is the ratio that works. Gotcha. Um, uh, if you're going to try it on the hardest case that you're not even sure you want the person to stay in the company, I might try it on a case where you're sure you want the person to stay in the company. And now let's see them accelerate their improvement. But I'll take any case. You can say, look, give me your lowest performers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the way to make them better is to focus on what they've done well. Um, Cause it's, it's very rarely bad people behaving badly. Mm -hmm. It's good people that have gotten into bad habits. Yep. And so we, the way to do that is to understand them and see what they are doing. Ah, so you're late on everything. Um, and I hadn't realized that you stay late to help Joe. Joe didn't right. mention it. You didn't mention it. And that's great. But instead of working on the second order effects, I need you to be selfish for a little while and work on the first order effects. Work on your work first, and then you'll have the luxury to help others or whatever the heck the context is. Yep. Um, that's good. Because I think one of the things I, I like to do here on the show, uh, Francis, is, is take something from the classroom or from deep amount of research and then make it practical for the person yeah, yeah, who yeah. is in Let's that do every job. scenario. Love it. Love Absolutely. It. Okay. And I know that's part, that's kind of how you teach as well when it comes yeah. to at, at, at Harvard business school is it's, it's mainly done on case studies, correct? So you're actually talking about in the moment, we love real, these. right? Yeah. Real moments. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I think what I'd like to shift to though is the trust triangle. Um, you've got a, a, a viral TED talk that focuses on trust, and you've written a lot about this as well. And I, I really, you, you talk about the triangle of three components, which is authenticity, logic, and empathy. Can you expand on why those are the three keys to sure. developing trust? Sure. And we got obsessed with trust when we saw that it was blocking progress for individuals and organizations. Mm -hmm. And so we went in like anything else and tried to see what was getting in the way. And uh, we first saw that empathy was really big. And then we realized that logic was very big and then authenticity. And then we never found a fourth one. So for years, it stabilized as three. We were totally happy for it to be four, but we never got there. And then that coincided with my learning from Emma Dench about ancient Rome. And I taught a course with her about leadership lessons from ancient Rome. It changed my life. Um, uh, and ancient Rome, and, and she also uh, knew a lot about ancient Greece. And then we got, I got in touch with Aristotle, which many people did before me. And when he talked about persuasion, and he used logos, pathos, and ethos. And I was like, well, those actually feel quite comparable. I mean, he was talking about persuasion, we're talking about trust, you nudge it, but it made me think that three needn't be incomplete. 
So we still are open to a square. It's just, it's been over 10 years and we haven't needed a square. <laughs> so, um, and we got Aristotle on our shoulder. Got you. Uh, in, in one of Stephen Covey's books called The Speed of Trust, he has yes. two. Two, yeah. which are character and competence. And that relates a bit because logic, I would say, is some of the competence. And then character could, could be some of the authenticity and empathy, I would assume. So why, yeah. the, why, why those three for you? Well, because um, I can see if you collapse authenticity and empathy, I, I can show the if you have an authenticity wobble, my diagno that, that diagnosis, my prescription for you to fix that is completely different than my prescription for you to fix an empathy wobble. Mm. So um, I would never, I mean, Stephen Covey is magnificent, mm -hmm. um, but I, for my purposes, you won't get a refined enough diagnosis to have an accurate So you need to go deeper. You need to go deeper. Yeah. And, and, and so share with me why authenticity from a lead, and this is a big buzzword now, but I know there's more, there's more behind it. Why is authenticity from a trust perspective is so vital? Yeah. So if I'm talking to you and you feel like I'm saying something I don't believe in, doesn't matter what I'm saying, you're going to just tune me out. You're not going to mm -hmm. believe me. Whether I'm a politician, whether or not I'm a middle manager who my boss gave me a message that I don't agree with and now I got to go tell the team and I tell the team the message from my boss, it's clear I don't agree with it. The sec people, aren't gonna, people are going to stop trusting me because they no longer will know when I'm telling the truth and when I'm not, when I'm being authentic or not. So mm -hmm. um, I think that authenticity is, I mean, I find it's the hardest one um, to overcome. Uh, but it's also, uh, I think right now, um, it's typically difficult for people that are different to bring forward their authenticity. I think with this global pandemic, all of us are going to feel, a lot more of us are going to feel different. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to kind of all be in the same authenticity boat. What do you mean uh, feel different? So, you know, uh, I have no idea, I'm not asking you, but I have no idea what's going on in your family status, your health status, the, but you probably have more nuanced stuff going on today than you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, I can't tell it from appearances. So age, gender, you know, sexual orientation, vet set, like all of the typical race, all of the typical ways we were looking at difference, which mattered. Um, you wouldn't perhaps have fit into those, but you're also now got different stuff going on because we have just added so many more degrees of difference mm -hmm. um, that uh, people that thought they were in the same category are no longer in the same category. Socioeconomic, wealth, health, like all of these things are, like whether or not I have an office to work, uh, to work in. I think that that's kind of good news because um, it used to be that those that were underrepresented had authenticity wobbles. Well, if all of us are uh, in a category that's less represented, we're all gonna have authenticity wobbles. That means we can all set the conditions for one another's true authenticity to show up. So instead of this being like a side gig for some people, it's going to be like the main, the, you know, the main attraction for more people. And I think that's really cool. Hmm. Um, so you brought up an example of something that I've personally messed up more than a few times. And so maybe we can get practical for a second from an sure, authentic sure. authenticity standpoint. There have been moments in my managing career I'm not proud of where I received the message from above. I really disagreed with it but I still had to roll it out and I, I just fumbled the entire thing. And, and sometimes I would either throw the boss under the bus, you know, which you obviously shouldn't do. And other times I would be like, well, I got to kind of like be the company guy here and I would be lying or, or I saying like, I'm into, I believe in this and they know I'm not right. And so I've tried it multiple different ways, messed it up multiple different ways. Let's say someone listening right now is that person. They have 14 direct reports. They're a mid-level manager, regardless of their title. 
they got a message from above the CEO or whatever saying, we're going to do X. And as a manager, I thought that is so stupid. I don't agree with that. I don't want to do that, but I kind of have to, unless I'm going to leave this company. What are some practical tips or ideas sure. for that person right now who is getting that message and they don't agree with it? Yeah. So lying and throwing someone under the bus, as you indicated, are bad strategies. So we yes. just put those out there. Um, I can tell you so, both, neither work. <laughs> neither work. Neither work. Uh, so you have to understand the context well enough so that reasonable people can disagree about the right thing to do. Mm. So you understood it. They want to do X. You think doing X is crazy. You can't talk to people yet. You have to talk with the one who's saying X or with their people enough so that X seems like it's an alternative. That is, you have to understand the context well enough so that reasonable people can disagree with X and not X. Hmm. If you don't understand that well enough, you will never do a good enough job representing. And by the way, reasonable people can disagree because it's not hmm. like all of your bosses are dumb. There's just no right. chance. Right. They just understand more of the context than you do. And you have to do the work to understand that context. If you don't do that, everyone will see it immediately. Some of the research shows that not only when you're talking, like in five seconds, we'll be able to see if you're not authentic, but we could turn the volume off <laughs> and in about five seconds tell that you're not authentic. So you really have to get to a point where it's not dumb in your mind. It's a place where reasonable people could disagree. And this was the decision that was taken. And then when you roll that out to your team, do you just lay it all out there? Hey, like, do you say you disagree or like, or, or I don't think you, what, I don't yeah. think your feeling should matter that much. You can, okay. you can say, look, this is like, this is why our, our leaders jobs are so hard. This is non-obvious. It could have been this or this here's with all of the data they're choosing to do this. And it could go either way, which is why they need all of our support behind this. You know, you. Yeah, no, I love, I was just taking notes because I'm okay, writing down good. these quotes. <laughs> I'm writing down these quotes because the, especially like this is non-obvious and this is why our leaders jobs are so hard. This is something yes. I like to share with people who have never been a manager and they want to be is be careful when it comes to cri always criticizing the CEO or the VP or the frontline Ooh, manager, be yeah. careful because that you're, you're judging their actions or behaviors with, with a limited amount of the information and they probably have more. And one, it's just not useful to judge anyway, but certainly with that, with, with, with a, a, a fraction of the same information that they have. And so I'm, I always share that. And this is something I did too, as an individual contributor. So I'm learning from my own mistakes, but, but, but try not to do that. It's not really useful to be judging that person, especially criticizing that person when you don't fully know what they're dealing with. No. And I guess what you can say is like, if we played a meta video, like the people that are looking at you criticizing someone and watching your overconfidence with obviously not enough information, you're going to like go down in our esteem pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so true. Um, okay. Uh, the, the other two parts of that are empathy and logic. So yeah. I want to tackle each, each of those. Let's, let's go to empathy next, Francis, as sure. to, it's, it's, it sounds obvious. Well, of course, you got to be empathetic. You know, you got to think of other people, you know, put them first. So can you share the importance of empathy when it comes to building trust? Yeah. So it's, it's not like what's in your head. Like you're empathetic to my needs. If I need to trust you, you don't get credit for what's in your head. It's whether or not I experience your empathy. So that's the first thing. So, um, and I will experience your empathy if you are super present to me and to my needs. It's not any more complicated than that, but I'll give you lots of ways where it goes wrong. Okay. So a way that you cannot be present to me is if you're multitasking in front of me. Mm -hmm. So if you're using your phone while I'm talking, you're not present to me. You are, now I'm not going to think that you're empathetic. I'm not going to trust you. So that's like the easiest one. If you want to do it even quicker, 
be on your phone when I talk, but don't be on the phone when someone more senior talks. <laughs> mm. Then you have lost trust with absolutely everyone. The old kiss up, it's, kick down mentality of that. Or just, all... or pay attention up and distract, give yeah. your attention up and your distraction down. Yeah. So I think the empathy is to be present to people and to the needs of people. So I was simply doing presence, like, be there when you're there. And when you're not in front of me, go do all the multitasking you want. Um, go put the oxygen mask on all you want. But when you're in front of me, if you have an oxygen mask, you should be looking to give it to other people. That's like what empathy is. Um, and to be present to the needs of me, you kind of have to inquire about the needs of me. Like it's super hard to read minds. The, I, I have said, this is some advice and I, 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 love that part, Francis. Um, if do not have your phone in sight during a one-on-one -on -one meeting, unless your wife is nine months pregnant, like that's what I've said to people, like, unless like there is a, there is something that is that type of emergency where you're getting ready to go to the hospital for something and it, whatever you can, you could add a different type of, uh, example, but that's one that I've said to a young guy once, actually, I said, is, is your wife nine months pregnant? No, then get your phone away back. It, it, out of your pocket, in your bag, not sitting on your desk, not even upside down on your desk, get it out of sight and definitely never, ever, ever look at it when we're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting ever with no exceptions, unless I said one of those emergency type situations, if not that put it away. And I, it blows me away though, Francis, that this is, this is out there. People know this and it's constantly messed up. Why? Well, cause yeah, cause, um, if it's not in a one on one meetings in group meetings, you'll watch people who are on their phone and they might be the senior people in the meeting. Yep. And so the senior people in the meeting are saying, this is what the cool kids do. Yep. I mean, I've gone to companies where what the cool kids did was text one another in the meeting about the meeting. Yep. <laughs> now, here's the good news of that. Oh my God, we're about to be so much better. <laughs> like by creating such a climate of black and like not safe and no, everybody's not paying attention. So your speed is like terrible. Your quality is terrible. Technology off and away, we're all present to the needs of everyone. Oh my gosh, we got to start making decisions of higher quality and faster speed than ever. So I don't condemn those behaviors. I say, look at how much better tomorrow we're going to be than we are today. Because look what you've been enduring. I can't believe you've been enduring it. The positive reinforcement method. One <laughs> other little tip, uh, Francis, and I, you've probably done this too, but um, whenever you're getting ready and, and I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one meetings, but this could apply to anything or, yeah. or even just meeting with a person in general. So I'm sitting behind my desk right now and across my desk, I have chairs for guests that can sit, that come in Yeah, is, is, is be very intentional about, I would move my chair to the side actually of my desk. So there's no barrier between me and the person, or at least like near the edge of my desk. And then sometimes they even would scoot over without even thinking about it so that we, I'm not looking at my computer. Yeah. Uh, we are a hundred percent. I'm dialed in to you for this one-on-one -on -one meeting. Now I might have like a notepad where I'm going to take notes because I like to write and think and think and, 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 and certainly to, to be there for you, but there's no phone, there's no computer and even yeah. try to remove barriers between us to say it's us together. Yeah. I, and I think anything you can do that's the equivalent of putting technology off and away. The yeah. physical barriers, I, I find some people like a little bit of barrier, some don't. I don't have any opinion there, but I'm sure you're doing it the right way because you are present to the needs of others. Yeah, and it's that's kind of just like be, be thoughtful about it, you know, and also th yeah. th th think, think about some of the situations you've had that have worked really well and some that haven't and why yeah. and deconstruct that process. Okay. The third, third part of the trust triangle here, Francis is logic. Um, explain <laughs> why logic is so imperative when it comes to building and developing trust. Yeah. So, um, let's say that like you, it's the real me and I'm in it for you, but I have terrible ideas. So it's the real me and I'm in it for you, but literally my ideas are just, they, they contradict themselves. They haven't been all that thorough. You're not going to trust me. There's no amount of authenticity and empathy that's going to make up for a lack of logic. And by the way, there's no amount of logic that can make up for a lack of empathy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that we have to have trust in the rigor of someone's logic. And pretty much the only way to do that is for you to give us enough transparency into the logic so we can see for ourselves. Um, so I have seen people fall down on logic lots of times, and it's for two main reasons. Either they're really not very logical and they've communicated that perfectly effectively. That's a substance, like your substance of your logic is, and we have ways to overcome that. Or, and this is the one that's more heartbreaking and much more common. I have good sound logic, but when I communicate it, it doesn't get to your ears correctly. Like it loses something in translation. That's a style problem, right? My logic is sound, but I stylistically can't communicate it. So there's substance and style. Well, we really need to know which one it is because you can imagine the substance prescription is very different than the stylistic prescription. So we got to figure out which of those it is. And then we know how to overcome both of them. Separately. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like, does he or she know their stuff? And then does that person understand how to properly communicate that to, to the team, to the person? That's and, style. Yeah. That's a yeah. style logic problem. That's the style. But then do they know their stuff is kind of the substance? To, have they done the proper research? As you said, like, do they have intellectual rigor behind what they're doing where you, where you look and say, that leader knows what they're talking about? And they can tell their story, and that's the substance and style. Yeah, but here's the thing. If, if, if you have a style problem or a substance problem, both come across to me as you're not logical. And in one case, you knew your stuff, and in the other case, you didn't. Gotcha. That's Makes why sense. it should be terrifying to people. <laughs> Wait, explain. <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, so, so, like, so do you have a brother? Yes, I have two. Okay. What's one of their names? AJ. AJ. So Ryan and AJ both said something and we questioned both of their logics. Ryan really knew his stuff. He just communicated it in, ineffectively. We questioned his logic. AJ didn't know his stuff. He communicated the lack of knowing perfectly effectively. <laughs> we don't trust him. So AJ has to learn how to build logic. Ryan has to learn how to better communicate. Okay, I love it. Uh, very... Sorry, AJ. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, he's probably watching or listening. Um, okay, I, I want to throw a little curveball at you. Are you are you okay yeah. with that? Okay, um, I sure am. So the second person I spoke with is a friend of mine who I worked with at a previous company named Guyon Randall. Guyon was a student of yours at Harvard Business School. He said you would not remember him, uh, not because you, you uh, of anything uh, that you did. It's just because he said I was not a remarkable student, even though Guyon's literally one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's an inc and he's a thoughtful, nice, incredible guy. Um, I was lucky to be a part of the group that that hired him at a company I used to work. And he gave me a, a number of things. Uh, first of all, he did say he he was when he took your class. He had a broken foot. He was in a cast with crutches, and he often would show up late. And that is very frowned upon at Harvard Business School. And yet, you were very empathetic towards him because of his injury, which just, just wanted to note that he said that, that that was a big deal to him and it meant a lot. And he said, she doesn't even remember it, but it meant a lot to me. But the, the, the part that he brought up that I wasn't sure about was about persistence. And here's what I mean when I say persistence. He had mentioned to me that you were rejected by Harvard Business School a few times before getting a shot to be a part of the faculty. Um, and then once you became part of the faculty, have gone on to win multiple awards for being literally one of the most impactful teachers in the world uh, for many years. And his, his question to me is, I'd be curious to hear about how she thinks about persistence or why didn't you just go somewhere else as opposed to keeping at it when it comes to yeah. somebody who may be, because there are a lot of people who are, I mean, people are rejected all the time. Everyone can relate to this. And yet you go on to become one of the, the, the best teachers in the world um, at one of the most prestigious institutions in the world after being rejected. I'd love to hear your thought process behind sure. that. Sure. And I think I was rejected five times to just to put five the times. Wow. Um, you know, starting from out of high school, I applied to go to college and they said no. And then out of college to go to graduate school, no. Out of graduate school for the first time on the faculty, no. 
Um, first time I wanted to come up for tenure, they said, not now. Um, when there was a new administration and I thought I could help and the people, the real helpers were the senior associate dean, they said, not now. Um, uh, and so I have a couple of things to say about that. One is I was pretty sure that Harvard was the place for me to be. And I figured I just wasn't doing a good enough job of presenting who I was. Hmm. I also don't really ever want my life to be influenced by mere mortals. And institutions don't make decisions. The mortals inhabiting the institutions make decisions. So what was I going to do? Let the person who was making the high school <laughs> decision like influence my life's trajectory? I don't believe in that. Um, now, if they're providing a useful signal, great. But I didn't find any of the signals to be all that useful other than I needed to go and, you know, like help with the framing of the packaging. The reason I think I'm glad I stuck with it is I do think I thrive at HBS and I have been able to give back in ways that are, I, I hope, somehow make up for how much I've thrived uh, with it. So if I was gonna go ahead and say I was right <laughs> and the five times were wrong, I want people to take that point of view. It's a mortal making a decision. So go and get better so that you can overcome even the mere mortals, but don't let mortals influence your life's trajectory. My goodness, think about all the decisions you've made that you hadn't really thought too much about. You'd be horrified to know it was influencing somebody's life trajectory. Hmm. Not to say I wasn't mad, I was mad each time. Were you motivated by that? Um, yeah, I was mad. And then the motivation was just always there. Like you couldn't take away my motivation with a no. It, well, it, so the, the motivation was intrinsic. So it, it, yeah. you, there, there's a lot out there in the sports world, especially now with this big Michael Jordan documentary yeah. that came out where <laughs> he, 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 he had to create slights. He had to create what people would call haters, even if he made them up because it, 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 it kind of fueled him. Now, I don't personally think that leads to a happy life because you don't have anyone to celebrate with when you win if you're just trying to um, yeah, you know, f the haters, as people would say, and, and that's I, not, that wasn't me. Yeah, that like, wasn't I, me. I, I yeah. sense that I, with I somebody was, who's more like you seem happy. That yeah, you, I, I I I personally subscribe to the method of I'm going to prove my supporters right. I'm very lucky and extremely privileged to have great yeah. support, and so my goal is always to prove them right. And when I do, we celebrate. Right. And when I don't, I'm yeah. bummed out, but I can go to them and I, and I work at it and continue to go. And I'm curious, like, it, it, I think I, uh, to me, I, I thought I was, I must not have been presenting myself in a foolproof enough way. Right. So that I so you took ownership of it. You, you, you took ownership Definitely. over it. I gotcha. didn't think that it was something that someone else was doing to me, yeah. but I did think it was something someone else was doing that didn't have a lot of consideration of me. And so I wasn't going to put my life's journey in their hands. Got you. Got you. Okay. Cause I think that can be a useful, a useful way to view the world uh, by saying like, I'm not going to let mere mortals define me or make, yeah. make the decision. So I me. don't take a no that, so, you know, uh, if a school rejects one of our kids, uh, I would apply again the next year. I'm not sure my wife would. <laughs> really? Why? Yeah, she's like, because she's like, you had a chance. <laughs> oh, like your loss type of thing? Yeah. And like, you know, she gets a little madder than I do. I don't, you know, I don't expect a yes right away. She has far more of an expectation of a yes. Gotcha. Uh, in the beginning. And she takes that as a signal from people. Uh, she's gone farther in the world than I have. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that this how is how do you I measure am. who has gone farther in the world? Uh, she's a better version of me in every way. So she's at least relatively farther than me. Huh? That's an interesting dynamic. I wonder, I would probably say the same for my wife. Uh, so I don't know. I, I just think that's, that's interesting to when, when you say that it has better in like all aspects that, cause like, it's like yeah. defining success. Like how do you define success? I guess I'm curious. Everyone has different definitions. Uh, 
Yeah, so the amount that I am able to move other people, like can I help remove the obstacles in other people? And so I can do it through talking um, and through writing. We write together. She's a beautiful writer. I edit. I'll like go test things on the stage and I'll edit, but she's the beautiful writer. So if you can pick up this book and read it, which I think you'll be able to, it's because of her. Gotcha. Uh, Well, at the front of your book, Unleashed, the, the newest book, you have a quote from Toni Morrison that says, just remember yeah. that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. To choose that quote to put at the very front of your book means it's extremely meaningful for you. Uh, why is that one so impactful and that you want to make sure everybody sees as they're cracking yeah. open your book? You know, when, we, when the subtitle of the book is, the guide to empowering everyone around you, right? It's the unapologetic leader's guide. We don't want you to hesitate in this. Toni Morrison, we're hoping, will make it unapologetic for you. And it is the greatest thing that you can do with your power is to empower someone else because it also realizes that you must have been empowered to get your power. Mm -hmm. And I think the demographic tendencies associated with who we choose to empower have been too often we empower people who are just like us. Mm -hmm. We got empowered by people who are just like us and we empower people who are just like us. And so that's having Toni Morrison saying it. I want us to, and I think what's implicit in her saying it is, empower someone who's different than you is really what you'll get by reading our book. Like, don't just follow your natural instincts. I mean, it's, it's better than empowering no one. Mm -hmm. But empower someone who needs it more than you do. It's a great point. It's a great message too. And it's so useful. And this thought of diversity of thought. I mean, Shane Snow has done a bunch of work on this, but the, if, if you're trying to build a dream team and a fantastic team at work, that that is one of the, the key indicators of building a successful team is having diversity of thought. And diverse, diversity of thought is, is usually built from people with wildly different backgrounds and upbringings and places that they've grown up. And, and that's something that I've had to learn. When I, when I got my first manager job, Francis, I was like, I just want to hire 15 me's. That's it. Yeah, I mean, That's course. how self-absorbed I was. Like, I just well, want 15, it's also, you, know? you knew how to make people like you better. Right. It, I'm right. not even sure it was irresponsible. It was like all you could do yeah. in the beginning. True. But you'll get thumped by a diversity of thought team. And Correct. then you'll be like, whoa. <laughs> what was this? Yes, yeah. I- I- exactly. The, uh, I'm curious from a leadership perspective, I did hear that you, did you play point guard in college? Uh, number two guard. Two guard. <laughs> so okay. Now you're talking about, this is when basketball, you didn't have to be good to play basketball. This is a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> okay, but did, I want it, because I, I, when I, when I, I heard that we shared, Guyon told me that, by the way, that you played basketball in college. Yeah. Uh, when I heard that you played basketball and I played college football, uh, a kinship amongst p- playing sports in college, and I learned so much from the athletic fields that I tried to transition to the world of, of leadership outside of the, the fields. Is is there was there a form of leadership that was developed through playing sports, or uh, is that was there a love potentially built then, or was it after the fact? Um, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I loved basketball. Uh-huh. I didn't have very many great leaders, um, so I had a different coach every year in high school. So, like, wow. literally four coaches in four years. Yeah. My coach in college was not particularly effective at any of the leadership aspects <laughs> of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't think I learned about leadership playing sports, but I learned about reliance playing uh-huh. sports. Um, I learned what it's like to be reliant on others. And I learned that I really liked to be relied on. Mm. Um, so if you, you liked the responsibility, you, I liked it a lot. Yeah. I liked it a lot. So um, it's great that I can rely on you, but if you need me to do something on the court that's going to make you better, I'll do it. Interesting. Uh, and, and that then pushed you into this path of studying this at a deeper level. Yeah. And, and then I, I got to realize that um, for you to rely on me, you're going to have to trust me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of the things go, and we need both the reliers and the... <laughs> you know, the person who's going to take the last shot or the person who needs someone else to make sure they get the ball in the right place to take the last shot. 
Um, and I took far fewer last shots um, than um, maybe the quality of my play deserved because I could always see how to set other people up. And there were, what was the chance of me being in the best spot when there's five people on the court? Well, 20%. So I sure hope I'm not doing it more than 20% of the time. Mm, interesting. One of the, the people that you were called upon to help is someone that I think a lot of, a lot of others did not trust. And I'm not sure there's probably a mixed response on this person at this time. And that's Travis Kalanick, former oh. uh, founder, CEO of Uber. And he went through- Not a mixed response from me, but a mixed response from your audience. Correct. It, just people yeah. in general um, yeah. that, that are out there reading and, and writing about, about him. Um, and I'm curious about what was, what, like, if you could take us inside as much as you can, you've written about this, sure. but, but take us inside the story of when you were considering working with Travis and trying to, to, to make Uber a better place. Cause there's a lot written about some of the, the, the issues there. And you were one of the, I think the, the main person brought in to try to help fix it. Can you take yeah. us inside the story sure. with, uh, of, of Uber and you working with Travis? And it goes back, it goes back uh, quite a while now, but this was in the, so the spring of 2017 and I joined mm -hmm. full time June 1st, 2017, but I worked with them a lot the, le the months leading up to that. Um, I think they called me after the Susan Fowler blog came out that showed like just hideous things going on inside of the organization. Um, and Travis learned about the, that stuff when the rest of the world learned about that stuff by reading about it. Uh, and I've been with quite a few organizations at this point when the senior team learns from the newspaper and that's a really difficult place to be in. And then you got to fix it so that that doesn't happen. But so I read everything about Uber and about Travis and had no desire to work with the person I read about, like zero. And I'm in a very lucky situation. I'm tenured at the Harvard Business School. Like I'm, I own, I get to choose who I work with. I work only with good people who I believe will uh, have a noble purpose in what they're doing. Life's too short. So I read all about uh, Uber and Travis and I was like no way except for a student asked me to meet him who I really respected mm. and she was like just just come out and meet him and I said okay I will because I respect you um, but I thought I was flying out and flying back in fact I had the red eye back the same night I was just sure I was going to do that Wow. Um, and I met this guy who uh, said, look, the last company I led had eight people. I, this company has gotten away from me. I have like leadership. We like the company and I don't know how to do it. And um, while the strategy is clear in my head, it's not clear in the minds of people walking around the company. And so people are making decisions at odds with one another and it's super inefficient can you come help? Hmm. So I said, well, let me spend some time with, so I went around and spent time with the company, teaching, doing things, met people like Tuan Fan, who's the chief technology officer is amazing. I think I, he, he had me teach 1500 of the people in his organization just to see if the way I communicated was the way that they learned. And it went beautifully. And I just, I fell in love with these folks. Um, and so they were, totally good people who some of which had behaved quite badly and so some separation needed to exist but i think in june of 2017 we separated from 20 people there were like 15,000 employees it was 20 like it wasn't this um and the rest really i mean it was you know you'd get hired as an individual contributor five minutes later you get promoted to a manager you don't know how to manage yeah. Like you have your 14 people, like you don't know how to do it. So you do something wrong. What's the chance? A hundred percent. Yes. Uh, and then you get promoted to a manager of a manager. And <laughs> it's just, so uh, I went in and realized that we had to teach people management and leadership. Well, I come from a place where Belize and it can absolutely be taught. <laughs> You're not born with it. It can be taught and it can be taught uh, like quite rigorously and effectively and quickly. And then, because this was a company where revenue didn't have to be 
uh, higher than cost, where the physics applies part wasn't there. We really needed to teach the fundamentals of strategy because if you're in a business where the economics can be negative, you start thinking that all other kinds of things can be squishy. So we offered a strategy curriculum for the whole company, not to teach them Uber strategy, that was gonna be up to them to decide, but to teach them how to think about, how to think strategically. And then it would show some clarifying places with, oh, we're doing this and you're doing that in Uber. We gotta make sure these things work together. So, um, there was a lot of pioneering at Uber, and then we learned through the strategy work, there was a lot of re-pioneering at Uber. And so we wanted to get it back to pioneering. Great if you're novel, novelly doing the first thing, but not if somebody right around the corner has already done it and learned from it. We gotta learn how to learn from it. So I loved working with the company. I only overlapped with Travis from June 1st to like, for like two weeks. Oh, okay. Um, because that's when the board, uh, when his, uh, when his parents had a tragic accident and yep. the board then uh, thought it was a good time to have him separate. Um, would, did you, but I have, would you have wanted him to keep working there? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think it was absolutely. a mistake then to, 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 it's not for me to say it's a mistake. You know, the board's like who uh, I think the board, he, the board had clearly not had an effective relationship with him before. And I yeah. think they saw this as a chance I think the board thought that he was more powerful than they were, and they took this as a chance to separate from him. Um, so if I had a time machine, it would be to go back and work with the board <laughs> earlier to like, don't let a CEO become more powerful than you. Um, but do I think that Travis was like good enough realizing he needed leadership and strategy help? Do I think that he could have overcome this? Yeah. I, and I think he probably will in his next company. What was it like? They could they could literally have called anybody. I mean, like they could have called like presidents. They could have called of the United States. I think they could have called anybody, and 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 gotten a response. Somebody the the person on the other end would have taken a call from Uber CEO, and they called you. What was that? Was there a feeling of like, wow, I've I mean, I know you got a ton of other awards, but that, what was that moment like when they could literally call anybody in the world and they called you and you're like, oh, I don't know, you know, like I have to. Well, it, didn't, it didn't feel like, I mean, it was on fire and most people were walking away from it. So it didn't quite feel like, gosh, I'm the lucky one who got called. Most people said, what are you doing? Yeah. And I left HBS like I was fully intended when Travis and I talked about it, we thought it would take four years and you can only leave HBS for two years. So I thought I was giving up tenure at HBS when I went there. Like I thought the whole thing was gonna happen. Um, and then we learned that change happens quicker. And then with Dara coming in, we got all of the leadership stuff done. And then Dara made it super clear that this, he, he and he's come from a long history of strategy and he said he's got the strategy part. He doesn't need, you know, he and his team have that part. And so I left after the culture was fixed. And when I left, you couldn't, from then and up till today, like none of the stuff you read about could you imagine happening again. Hmm. Why do you think it became like a sport to, to write negative things about Travis? Um, I love journalists. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I feel like they help us. So um, if journalists have glommed on to something, they're writing what they conceive to be a longstanding wrong in my mind. So um, Perhaps they're going crazy that stuff was happening and no one was paying attention. Um, I um, I don't find fault. In fact, I read um, Super Pumped by Mike Isaac. I learned so much from it. I thought it was a really well written book. It, it, it didn't cover any of the time I was there, but I thought he did a really good job. So I... Um, I don't have fault in what was done by the journalists mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I, I really feel like it's a super important part of making sure everything is working. Sure. I w I, I'd like to close, um, Francis, with, with one other aspect of your newest book, Unleashed. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of, of highlights that you could, that I could hit on. I'll, I'll, I'll share an overview and then focus on one. But one, first, it's not about you. We've, we've talked about yeah. trust. 
Um, there's another aspect of belonging, uh, which is championing the difference and ensure that everyone can contribute. Strategy, which we've just briefly touched on, of show people how to create and capture value on their own. A culture, uh, how to turn around cultures quickly. But the one I want to focus on that I skipped over, as you could probably guess, because you know it's your book, is love. And the reason why that this really caught my eye is because your view of love is setting high standards and showing a renewal of deep devotion to, to them and to people. Can you talk to me about the importance of love with your team and setting high standards, but also ensuring they understand the deep devotion to them? Yeah, beautiful question. So uh, if I want to bring out the best in one other person, uh, through all of the work we've done, we've found it pretty clear that if I set really high standards for you, you have a chance of succeeding. That is, if I set low standards, very few people can thrive. So we need high standards. But we, if I just set high standards and I do it in a way, I could do it in a way that feels cruel, that doesn't, that feels like it's for me, like you should do this for me as opposed to for you. So the other thing that people need to thrive is to experience my deep devotion to their success. And I mean my deep devotion to their success. Well, if I'm just deeply devoted to your success, I could insidiously lower the standards and try to do the work for you. So what we have to do is learn how to simultaneously do both together in a world where most of us do one or the other and then get a little frustrated and flip to the other one and then flip back to the first one. So most of us spend our lives with high standards, low devotion, and then high devotion, low standards, and then just back and forth and back and forth. Great leadership comes when I, I can bring out the best in one person if I can get you to experience both at the same time. It's also what Anne and I think is the greatest act of love. If I can set the conditions for you to thrive, for you to like unimaginably thrive, that's like the greatest thing I can do for you. And it can does you, feel like love. I love it. Can you role play real quick? Let's say sure. I work for you. I've done a really good job. So I, I report to you. You're that manager with 14 people. I'm one of the 14. I've done a really good job. But on this particular task or project, I did not. But in the past, I have. And part of it was because I have love for you as, as my, my leader. What, what, what does that sound like when you're talking to that specific person? What are the words you would say to them of thinking of from a love perspective of high standards, but also deep devotion when they've, they've messed up or they've done a, they've done a poor job that doesn't, it doesn't live up to their normal standards? Yeah, so let's do it when they've messed up. Let's like sort of take the extreme. I find great learning is at the extreme. Great. I'd be like, look, I want us to wring all the learning we possibly can out of this mistake um, so that our return on the mistake is much higher than if it had gone well. So let's go through every bit of it. And let's not just you and me learn. Let's package it in a way that everyone gets to learn from this mm. so that this com becomes part of our, um, part of our culture. Um, and, you know, maybe the lesson is, I assumed that my customers post COVID were the same as my customers before pre COVID. So I went out and did things that I thought were going to matter without checking in with the customers again. And I completely missed. Let's like learn everything we can about the importance of like keeping a micro like thermometer on people. So whatever it is, I would try to make the learning as public as possible. Um, and thank the person for letting us use their example for uh, learning. Love it. That will insidiously also make them never want to be that person again. Sure, sure. <laughs> what would you say? Things like, I I know what you're capable of. We've done it together in the past. You've done it. And so that's part of this process is, and this has been said to me, you know, when I messed up, like, I know what you're capable of. And my job is to help you continue to perform and produce at that level. And this is part of the process. Let's understand what happened here. And so when I'm told, I know what you're capable of, I've seen you do it. I've, I've, I've witnessed it. It's incredible. It's great. That for me has, has been kind of the, that showing of love where it's yeah. almost like you disappointed a parent or disappointed someone because they know what you're capable of, yet you're not doing it. Yeah. And I, I might say something like, look, I want my boys to grow up in a world where you're fully unleashed. 
-hmm. We haven't achieved that yet together. Let's find out what the small obstacles are. I bet they're pebbles, not boulders, and let's sweep them away. Yeah, love it. Well, Francis, I could talk to you all day. I really appreciate your investment of time today. Uh, I certainly would encourage everyone to, to pick up this book, Unleashed. Uh, it's really well done. I know you're giving Ann more of the credit, but uh, The Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. It's really good. Where would you send uh, my listeners to learn more about you online? Uh, so I just dipped my toe in the water. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I started in January. Uh, Twitter scares me, but LinkedIn. Um, uh, and I try to publish every couple of weeks a uh, some thoughts. So I think LinkedIn is a great way uh, is a great way to do it. Perfect. Well, uh, l- look up Francis Fry on LinkedIn. Uh, and Francis, once again, thank you so much for, for, for investing your time with me. I'd love to continue our dialogue as uh, we yeah. both progress. And what number am I, Ryan? Oh, let's see. I'm in the 360s, 370s. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So oh, I'm going to wow. consider myself in some way your one-year anniversary. <laughs> 365 ish days of this. this that's good for me that's pretty wild i didn't i never thought of it that way because it's taken me five plus years but but, but actually if you l- list them out every single day is actually really wild I never thought of that yeah but thank you for saying that. i appreciate you being here it was really great i really loved it thank you all right thank you okay bye